Let's get started by thanking our wonderful sponsors who make this show possible every week. We can't thank them enough. Macular degeneration is a leading cause of vision loss, with 15% of Americans being at risk or already affected. Scientific evidence proves that by using mesozeaxanthin, lutein, and zeaxanthin together replenishes the macular pigment and promotes healthier vision. This formula comes in only one product, MacuHealth. With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day, the first and only FDA-approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age-appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. Hello and welcome to the Open Your Eyes podcast. I'm Dr. Kerry Geld, the host of the documentary, Open Your Eyes. Please visit the film's website at openyoureyes2020.com. Featuring interviews with more than 50 optometrists from around the country sharing information on eye care and eye disease. If you're new here and you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to get notifications of great new interviews. Also, please leave comments. Today's guest, board certified OBGYN and the developer of the very popular Galveston diet, Dr. Mary Claire Haver. Dr. Haver has become a social media sensation. The Galveston diet has grown to over 50,000 users and was developed to fight midlife weight gain in women. Dr. Haver, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to have you. I have to tell you that I had a patient who recommended that I interview you and she just loves you. She's one of your tribes people. So uh, she said, you have to have Dr. Haver on and to talk about the Gal Galveston diet. So what made you come up with it, with this idea of the Galveston diet? From Ga I know you're from Galveston, Texas. So I know that's what you named it after. Yeah, I named it after the place that I've raised my children and called home for over 20 years. But, uh, you know, I was a regular OB-GYN practicing here at the university. There's a big university here in town, a hospital. And... Um, I was, you know, aging with my patients as we tend to do, and I was still in the baby delivering phase, but had a crop of patient who was patients who were starting to go through midlife changes associated with menopause. And um, I would hear the same complaint over and over again, Dr. Haver, I am doing the same thing. I've changed nothing, not my diet, not my exercise routine. And I seem to be gaining weight, especially weight gain in my midsection what's happening. And, you know, I would just tell them what I had been taught to say for years, work out more, eat less, you know, hit the gym harder, count your calories, do all the things. And then you should see this get better. So they come back the next year for their annual exam. I did everything you said here. I'm tracking, here's my food journal, you know, and I'm still gaining weight. So you know, after I heard it enough times, I'm like, you know, what's going on here? These are reasonable women. These are, you know, I don't, I wasn't accusing them of being untruthful, but it just, I've been taught that has to work. There's no option. You know, the laws of thermodynamics, we can't negate those. But then I went through it. So really it's embarrassing to say, but the Galveston diet was really born out of my own frustration when it was my turn. I had lost my brother to <clears throat> liver disease kind of suddenly. And I had a pretty serious grief. And at the same time, I was starting to go through menopause. So at the end of six months of just negating, ne neglecting my nutrition, you know, stopped exercising regularly. I was really depressed from his death. And um, when I woke up from that, when the fog lifted and I felt like, okay, I can start getting me back. I was about 15, 20 pounds over my happy weight. Um, and it was mostly in my midsection, which had never really happened before. So and I could hear my patient's words echoed in my own brain, like, oh my God, this is now me. So I did all the things I taught them to do. I went to the gym, I worked out more, I was tripling down on my workouts very obsessively. And I was counting calories. I was going at 1,500, 1,300, 1,200, 900 some days, and it wasn't working. So I thought, okay, you know, it was affecting my relationship with my husband, my children. I was obsessed. It was just not healthy. And I'm like, okay, you got to snap out of this. This is not working. You're a scientist. You can't keep doing the same thing and expecting the same result. So I had some patients at the time who were registered dietitians and really the top of the food chain for nutrition is an RD, you know, registered dietitian. And they were like, you know, 
There's some studies coming out about inflammation and aging and menopause. You should look at that. There's some more studies coming out on intermittent fasting. There, there's some, cur you know, that's, that's making us curious. Start going down that route. But as far as like definitive answers for a woman in menopause, we don't have any. You know, there's not studies done specifically for you guys. So I'm like, okay. So I went down the rabbit hole of research, which for me was a healthy outlet because I love reading research. And I kept seeing this like chronic inflammation, chronic inflammation, aging, menopause, you know, this recurring thing. So I'm like, okay, what do we do to fight this? And everything that I could find was nutrition-based. There wasn't a magical pill or a potion or one supplement that would fix everything. It was really looking at patterns of eating, like like looking at the Mediterranean diet, why those people tend to die younger and not have as many health problems. You know, what are they doing that's so different than the way we're eating here in the US? So that's kind of how the science of it really started working in my brain. And really what led me to formulate the program. I experimented on myself first. It worked beautifully. My girlfriends are like, what are you doing? You look great. And I was like, well, came up with some principles that I'm experimenting on. They're like, we wanna do it. So I made Xerox copies. I'm dating myself Xerox um, at the Kinko's down the street and handed them out to my girlfriend, started giving it out to patients. And it just kind of grew from there. And here we are today. And then I launched it on social media just to see what would happen. And it exploded. So when you looked into the Mediterranean diet, people live longer? So yeah, um, they have, they, they live a little bit longer, but they, more than that, the, the, real, the real power in it is they have less diseases linked to chronic inflammation. So they have less heart disease, less stroke, less cancer. You know, their overall health as they age, they have a much better quality of life. For mo not for all, of course, but their levels of obesity, their levels of arthritis due to, you know, se uh, secondary to obesity, you know, all of those inflammation linked diseases tend to be much less in that population. You talked about intermittent fasting. I mean, that's, I find that fascinating. I know that's a big part of your program. There's three parts to your program. Mm -hmm. One of them is intermittent fasting and there's different ways to do it. You know, you listen to Jason Fong and some of the experts on intermittent fasting. And it, a lot of times it says you could do it kind of anytime you start eating at 12 at noon and stop eating at eight or, and uh, eat within maybe an eight hour window fast for, uh, fast yeah. for 16 hours. Mm -hmm. I find with myself now, I'm not a female, obviously, but with myself, it works best for me that if I eat a big breakfast, eat a big lunch, and maybe a tiny dinner around 4.30, and then I stop rather right. than the other way around. Right. But, I mean, obviously, it's a lot easier not to eat until dinner or not not eat till, till lunch and then eat dinner at eight and then go to bed. What do you think is the better way to do it? Or you, do you think it doesn't really matter? Um, there's a little bit of data with circadian rhythms that talks about, you know, uh, fasting in the morning versus fasting in the evening, but really the outcomes are just so infinitesimally different. What I, here's what I preach to our students. It's got to work. It's got to work for you. So the only intermittent fasting hourly rate that's going to work is the one that's going to actually work in your life. And so we have a lot of shift workers who follow us. You know, we have nurses, doctors, um, you know, firemen, you know, people who don't have normal schedules. And so we talk to them about shifting windows around and finding the window that's going to work for you, your family. When do you sit down for a meal? You know, the only thing that's going to work is what sticks. What I do preach, though, when you look at Mark Matson's data out of the NIH, he did some of the, the groundbreaking research on neuroinflammation, so Alzheimer's and dementia and fasting as a treatment program for that. You know, he looked at the 5-2 program, which is eating whatever you want five days a week and then doing an extreme fast, 500 calories or less, two days a week versus a 16-8, which is what we do in the Galveston diet. They both work. They both have the health benefits, not so much the weight loss, but the, the anti-inflammation benefits. What I find with our students, and we, you know, well over 50,000 now, we're almost at 57,000, um, is habit, building it into a daily habit. I don't believe in a cheat day mentality. I don't believe in taking days off. I believe in getting up every day and kind of doing the same thing so that your body is used to it. And one of the most powerful tools in our program is fasting for that reason. So I'd say our students, you know, me personally, I am able to do a 16, eight. And for me, it works better to fast in the morning um, and later in the evening. So my window is 12 to eight, but again, you do whatever window works for you. 
as long as you get roughly around 16 hours consistent. Do I do that every day? No. Do I do it almost every day? Yes. That's the important part. There are days where I'm not feeling well. I've, you know, have a cold or a virus or, you know, whatever. And I feel like I need to eat that day. I don't fly well fasted. So I get nauseated on the plane. So I break my fast earlier on the days that I have a morning flight. So, you know, you have to be flexible. It's real life, you know, but the majority of the days when it's just a normal, regular day, I fast with no problem. Talk about the side effects of intermittent fasting as far as brain fog, energy. How does it help us? So um, the, the pathophysiology of it is pretty fascinating. And again, I, I reference Dr. Matson a lot. He describes it as when we stress our body out just enough, it becomes more resilient. It doesn't induce damage. So it's the same concept of resistance training and exercise. When you stress your muscles out just enough, certainly we can damage our muscles if we overlift or push too hard too fast, you know, and cause tearing of muscle fiber. But when you stress it out enough, the body will respond by becoming more resilient. The practice of daily intermittent fasting seems to stress cells out just enough where they build internal mechanisms through changes in DNA and changes in protein synthesis that they become more resilient to disease. Now the brain fog, it turns out when you are in the fasted state and you have burned through all of the carbohydrates floating through your blood from the last meal and the glycogen stored in your liver and your body shifts to burning fat for fuel because that's all that's available, your brain actually works better on ketone bodies than it does on burning, super, uh, on burning glucose for fuel. You think faster, clearer. That's where most of our students come back during when they're fasted. And for most, it's the morning, but not everyone. And they're like, I'm a boss in the morning. I'm getting my work done. I've got my checklist. I'm, you know, because they just think so much clearer while they're fasted. Since you brought up ketone bodies, I have to ask you, and I know people ask you this all the time about the keto. Mm -hmm. How's your diet different than the keto diet? I, oh, uh, thank diet, you for the keto diet. I get that a thousand times a day. So I knew about keto when I developed Galveston diet, roughly. I hadn't really done a deep dive and, and I get asked how I compare to a thousand other programs because there's that many out there. I stay in my lane. I pretty much know what I know. I research what I've got. I don't purposefully look at other people's programs because I never want to be biased. I never want to get caught in that trap of, oh, ooh, that's a good idea. Let me borrow this. I just stay where I am. So as far as how we compare to keto, most keto, most the way most people do keto, the way I understand it is really, you will lose weight. The, the data on, on fast, quick weight loss is actually really good, but it's not sustainable. You know, people have a really difficult time, most regular people in sustaining that low of a carbohydrate intake for that long. There's social reasons, there's emotional reasons, you know, it's just, it's difficult to do. And then when they add those carbs back in, they gain the weight back plus then some. So it's really hard to sustain. Your inflammation levels, the way most people practice ketosis, will go up dramatically because you are, you are not feeding your body with the complex carbohydrates, the natural anti-inflammatories, the fiber. You're missing all of that. So I call it weight loss at any cost, which is just not something I'm willing to teach people how to do. So will you ever be in ketosis in a weight loss program? Yeah, in order, you develop ketone bodies every time you burn fat for fuel. And in order to lose fat, you have to burn it. So, but we don't check ketones. We don't care if you're in ketosis. That is not the goal of our program. And a lot of people confuse fasting with ketosis. You may hear from Dr. Fung or other people, and I'm not knocking what he does. I did read his book, The Obesity Code. Um, you may knock yourself out, you may not knock yourself out of ketosis if you do 50 calories or add this to your coffee or whatever, but you will break your fast. And we focus on fasting, not ketosis in our program. You brought up before the, a cheat day. A lot of bodybuilders, you know, mm -hmm. uh, their Sunday will be their cheat day and eat pizza or whatever they're going to eat. Uh, I find that if I do that with, with myself and a lot of my patients, what happens is it breaks, they become addicted again to these foods. So it's not so much that if they eat it once in a while, it's bad. It's just that they're addicting these foods and then they become re-addicted to the foods. Uh, explain why you think that uh, cheating doesn't work. I absolutely agree. I, I, one is, you know, my daughter is studying to become a registered dietitian right now. She's in, in university for that. And, you know, she talks about mama, food does not have a morality. You know, they learn that in their, in their 
in her, her undergrads in nutrition science. She said, you know, food is not good or bad. Certainly food is more nutritious or less inflammatory or whatever labels we want to put on it. But when we put the good and bad label and you're allowing yourself to eat bad food, that becomes an emotional thing with food. And like you said, you become re-addicted. And so, you, you know, we don't allow our students to beat each other up when they make a more inflammatory choice. We just say every day's a new day, start over. Look, at, you know, we also address the emotional components of this. Like, look at the reasons why you did that that day. We're not, you know, you're not allowing yourself to do this or that. You're an adult making a decision that you feel like is best for you. And, you know, we often, all of us, me included, fall back on old habits and behaviors when, when things get rough. And, you know, tomorrow's a new day when you slash a tire, no, wait, when you get a flat tire, don't slash the other three is what I tell people. And what I find when you allow yourself a cheat day, when you're giving yourself permission to make inflammatory choices, then you are slashing the other three tires rather than just one from one bad day. So a lot of people feel that you should eat every two hours. That was popular for a while. And I think some bodybuilders feel that way. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between eating every two hours and doing intermittent fasting? And what's the downside of eating every two hours? Um, I, I, don't, I really, it's hard for me to speak to the downside of it. I was, you know, in medical school, we talked about that being a good thing, but it turns out there really aren't many studies to support that, that, you know, it was a good idea. It seemed to make sense, but we didn't really have studies that showed that that was really helpful in a whole lot of ways. Um, so the thought process was it kept your blood sugar stable. You didn't have the drops, but really the most effective way to drop your blood sugar is to eat a lot of processed and simple sugars that dramatically raise your blood sugar quickly and cause a compensatory immediate rise in insulin, which then bottoms you out. And so fasting gets rid of this. When we look at the data coming out of, um, there's a, a great study where they looked at, they were obese, um, pre-diabetic, I believe, um, patients who were put on isocalometric diets. So they were matched, groups were matched, male, female, age, weight, whatever, two groups. Group A was put on intermittent fasting. So they ate the exact same thing in an eight hour window. And then the other group was eat on demand. And they measured multiple things. They, weight loss was similar, maybe a little bit more in the fasted group, but fasting is not a great way to lose weight. You know, it's great for inflammation, but not so much for weight loss because you can eat a lot and a lot of bad stuff. <laughs> I said the bad word, here I go. Um, you eat a lot of inflammatory things in your window, but they were eating the exact same thing. The fasted people had decreasing systemic inflammation levels, you know, they, and um, they also had a um, decreased abdominal circumference. So their visceral fat levels were lower than the people who ate on demand. So it's the practice of fasting in itself that will help lower your systemic inflammation levels. And they think because your insulin levels are lower and your fasting glucose levels are lower when you practice fasting. Um, that's theoretical, that hasn't been proven yet. Um, and that your, um, same thing, the visceral fat is directly related to your systemic inflammation levels. When you lower that, you stop driving so much fat to the viscera. Talk about inflammation. That's just the second part of your, your program. Mm -hmm. Why is inflammation bad and what can we do to keep inflammation low? Ooh, so chronic inflammation is kind of like high blood pressure. You know, you don't, unless it's super high, you have no idea you have it. You're just walking around living your life, doing your thing, but the it's, and it's just chipping away at your organs. Um, chronic inflammation does the same thing. You really don't feel that bad when you're chronically inflamed. You would just have a general sense of unease. This is kind of achy. You're just not feeling exactly right. You can't put your finger on it kind of thing while it is wreaking havoc on your end organ system slowly, but surely things that you can do, you know, to lower chronic inflammation are almost all nutrition based and stress release. So cortisol is a huge driver here and to lower cortisol, almost every way to do it is anti-inflammatory nutrition and things that relieve stress in your body. Um, meditation, journaling, you know, whatever works for you, going for a walk, talking to a friend. It's a little bit different for everyone, but really it's all the self-care me time. It's huge. It's, chemi it's biochemical and it really does help. Um, the other is filling your body with things that naturally fight inflammation. In the Galveston diet, we talk about eating the rainbow, trying to eat as many colors as possible because each of those colors represents a different phytochemical that is a natural anti-inflammatory or antioxidant. So anthocyanins in colorful fruits and vegetables, lignans in fruits and uh, nuts, um, and really avoiding the things we know cause inflammation, nitrites, artificial colors, artificial flavors, and processed carbohydrates are some of the most pro-inflammatory things that we can put in the body. And how about omega-3s? Are they helpful? 
yes, they're very helpful. And Americans just aren't getting enough of them. Um, the way most people eat in the Western world and the Western diet is a diet that's really rich in omega-6 fatty acids. And we do, there. that's an essential fatty acid. We do need it, but we're eating probably 20 times more than we should be um, because so much of the processed foods has corn oil or soybean oil, which is super high in omega-6. So we're getting way too much of that. Omega-3s, we're not eating a lot of fish. Um, daughter. Uh, we're not eating a lot of the fatty fish. We're not eating a lot of the flax and the chia seeds and the things that are rich in omega-3. So at the cellular level, um, the cell membranes are made up of um, the, the omega-3s can basically get deposited in the cell wall um, as a phospholipid. And the body, when it's going through its processes, just pulls whatever ph phospholipid is available and breaks it down. So if you're eating a diet rich in omega-6, you have more of that deposited in the cell wall, more, more available as a substrate. And so when the broken down, the breakdown products of omega-6 in excess are pro-inflammatory, whereas the breakdown of omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. What kind of protein do you recommend that people eat? Can they eat grass-fed steak? Do you is that on your yeah. program? Yeah, so whatever works for you. If you have a personal preference, um, you know, certainly we know that um, shellfish and fish can be more anti-inflammatory, mostly because of the richness in omega-3. Um, but, you know, everything in moderation. And, and in Galveston Diet, we talk about when we're making protein choices that are animal-based, let's look at the saturated fat. Okay, so lean is a little bit better because you have less saturated fat. Not that all saturated fat is bad, but you need to balance your saturated with your unsaturated fat. You need to be eating more. Our goal is just try to get more unsaturated than saturated fat. You know, in our house, we enjoy beef, fish, chicken, you know, um, some pork here and there. Um, but really, we're always balancing that with olive oil, with nuts, with seeds, with, you know, omegas um, as much as we can. When you're eating fish, are you concerned about the mercury content? Um, so we try to do wild caught uh, as much as possible. We eat, uh, the main fish we eat here is salmon. I do live in, on Galveston Island. We have lots of shellfish and fish available at the local seafood markets here in town, but that's, we're lucky. I mean, that's not everybody in America. So um, shellfish, I, I, I mean, mercury, I kind of look at that with nitrites. You just have to pay attention to labels, look at how things are caught and, and pay attention. In pregnancy, we really pay attention to mercury levels because of the potential teratogenic um, capacity. But for most um, mercury levels, unless you're eating a tremendous amount from mercury rich waters, it's not really an issue. How about things that we want to avoid such as maybe nitrates or food colorings? If you could talk about some of those things, chemicals in the food. So we definitely know that things can be inflammatory or even um, carcinogenic. So nitrates, nitrites, the way that meats are processed, um, some of the bacon, I mean, I love bacon, bacon fan here. I shop hard to find the nitrite free bacon to avoid, you know, that added complication. Um, so nitrites um, have definitely been linked to colon cancer in multiple studies, um, and it disrupts the gut bacteria, they don't like it. And so you end up with inflamed, um, you know, your gut gets a little inflamed when you eat too much of it. Also, the way some meat is smoked and cooked um, can be uh, more inflammatory. So we try to, you know, things as close to nature as possible, really not overcooking or over searing or over smoking something, you know, everything in moderation from time to time is fine. But we're talking about people who eat smoked meats every single day. Um, other is um, processed carbohydrates, you know, really looking at the labels of things in bags and boxes, watching out for added sugars, which are hidden everywhere, pasta sauces, and, you know, trying to get back to cooking more and, and trying to make things from fresh and homemade, which is really the healthiest way to go. Your last stage was is fuel refocusing. If you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. So um, that kind of encompasses one, getting away from counting calories because that just isn't working for most Americans. You fall into this trap where you start just looking for low cal or low fat or low whatever and buying things in bags and boxes that are heavily processed. So great. So instead of looking at calories, let's look at our mind micro and macronutrients. So we're trying to make sure we get enough calcium through our diet, enough fiber through our diet, enough magnesium through our diet, you know, and not just thinking we can out supplement inflammatory choices. Um, and looking at macronutrients, you know, what's the best balance? We have macronutrients we use to accelerate the weight loss process. And then we have macronutrients we shift to that are a little more sustainable for the long term. Vision Edge gives you less eye strain and reduced damage caused by blue light. We like to call Vision Edge sunscreen for the eye. 
It all starts with your highest level of visual performance, only achievable through scientifically proven Vision Edge. Tuning into the Open Your Eyes podcast. If you like the video you're watching, please hit the like button. Also hit subscribe for weekly new episodes of the podcast along with pod winks and bonus content. All right, let's get back to the show. And you recommend uh, less than 25 grams of sugar. Added sugar. So sugar is different. So when I talk about that, I'm not talking about that sugar that nature or God put in a food product. I'm talking about sugar that was added through processing cooking or just to make it sweeter after, you know, sprinkling sugar on cornflakes or something like that. So, and learning how to look for added sugars in the products that we buy from the grocery store. And that is, does that include honey, agave? Yes. Yes, thanks for asking. So, so table sugar, which is sucrose, um, is in the same category as honey. Um, honey does have a couple of added additional health benefits, but it still is sugar. And agave nectar is the other, still sugar. You know, your body recognizes it as sugar and treats it as such. I interviewed Robert Lustig, you know, about high fructose corn syrup. What, what oh, do God. you feel about high fructose corn syrup? And it's what does the- that do? <laughs> It's the worst thing in the world. It's so addictive. It's something that has been, you know, abused so terribly by food processing companies. And, uh, you know, that is one of the top things that you avoid at all costs. And most people get the majority of their um, high fructose corn syrup through uh, soft drinks. And um, I could wax you know, (laughs) prolifically about that, but it is one of the most addictive substances. And when you do a side-by-side comparison as to how quickly it raises the blood sugar, what it does to your insulin level with just innocent table sugar, it's dramatic. It's so much worse for you than just sprinkling a little bit of table sugar on something. And how about someone needs something sweet, any type of artificial sweeteners that are good, such as stevia? Yeah, so stevia and monk fruit are plant-based. And so you don't have the, the wrecking of the gut, um, you know, microbiota that saccharin or, you know, um, the chemical sweeteners have. And so if you're wanting to add some sweetness to a meal, you might want to consider those two sugars. Just, we recommend doing those in the eating window, not in the fasting window. So people like, can I, what should I add stevia to my coffee if I want something sweet? So we kind of counsel against that because they do stimulate the sweet receptor on the tongue, which is why you interpret them as sweet which may cause a compensatory rise in your insulin levels looking for the sugar load it thinks is coming. You might undo some of the anti-inflammatory goodness of fasting by doing that. Have you ever used D-ribose as a sweetener? I haven't. I should. I, is that a sugar alcohol? I have to look into uh, it. No, it, it's, it's actually used in Europe uh, for heart patients. Oh, so wow. it's one of the awesome foursome that Dr. Sinatra recommends, but it happens to be sweet. And I'm not sure how good or bad it is, but sometimes I'll use that when I need something sweet or I'm going to play softball just to kind of, because it gives you, it gives you energy. It's not something you would use at, at the end of the day, but something you may want to, you might want to look into. Somebody may ask you about that at some point. Okay. Yeah. That's a great one. I'll look that one up. Uh, how about supplements? What supplements do you like? Um, oh. Okay. So I have to preface this with, and I preach this constantly in our, in with our students is, you can't out supplement poor choices and you need to get the bulk of your nutrition from food. We supplement to fill a, a gap, okay? To try to, you know, if you can't get it through your diet. So omega-3 is one. People have a difficult time. They are allergic to fish or they don't like it or it's not available. You know, a healthy version is not available where they live. So, you know, that is something I recommend an omega-3 supplement for. Um, at the same time, I'm like, and avoid added omega-6 as much as possible. If omega-6 is naturally occurring in a product, that's fine. But if it's processed in a baked good, you want to avoid that as much as possible. I recommend um, quite often a fiber supplement. So a woman, which is most of our students are women, a woman should get 25 grams of fiber in her nutrition per day minimum. A man, I believe it's 33 or 34 grams. So a little bit more for a man. Um, and so most Americans on average are only getting about half of what they should get. So I have people track what they eat for a week, see where their fiber lands and then supplement if there's a gap. Um, vitamin D. So if you look at just the general population, about 42% of us are deficient in vitamin D for a menopausal woman, that number can pro- approach 85%. 
So I do kind of routinely recommend a vitamin D supplement. You can take about 2000 international units of vitamin D a day and, and stay out of trouble, not become toxic, uh, most experts. What do you recommend on so the that's my top, my top that's optimal on vitamin D? It depends on where you are. So, you know, your physician, you can, I've, I've seen physicians prescribe like 50,000 I use per week for someone who was severely deficient. And, but again, you only take that, that's kind of a booster for short term. And then they taper them down to whatever level they need. Some people don't absorb it very well, never see the sun. They live in a, you know, Seattle or somewhere where there's not a lot of sunshine or they're very dark complected. They don't have the conversion because of the melanin in their skin where most of us get our vitamin D from sunshine. But because we wear sunscreen or you know we avoid the sun for skin cancer reasons or, or, or just our poor converters, we run low as a, as a community usually in vitamin D across the board. But when you look at labs, are you looking for any optimal number that you want them between 50 and 80 nanograms per ml? So it just, well, that's one that depends on the lab. Um, some will, de will present it in milligrams per deciliter. Some, you know, it really just depends on the lab. I usually just follow. I try to try to shoot for the middle of wherever the lab high-low areas were. If you could explain the difference between insoluble and soluble fiber. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. For, I love that. That's on my face. Okay. So um, soluble fiber is fiber that, that dissolves in water. So if you take a fiber supplement and shake it up, it'll, the water will turn grayish brownish and that's the soluble fiber that is as dissolved in water. But then there's a component that will separate out if you're doing psyllium husk, which is the most common fiber supplement out there. That's what Metamucil is made of. So psyllium husk is about a 70-30 mix of soluble to insoluble fiber. They each have very different jobs in the body. Soluble fiber is what feeds the, I keep saying this, the gut microbiome. So the, the gut bacteria love soluble fiber. It's their food. They ferment it in the gut and create a, a butyrates, you know, it's the byproduct of the fermentation process. And the butyrates is what gets absorbed through the colonic cells and keeps them healthy. Um, insoluble fiber is the fiber that doesn't dissolve it. It precipitates out. It's the fiber that creates bulk in the stool and pulls water into the stool to make it pass through the colon more quickly. And you get the health benefits from that as well. Calcium. Soluble fiber is what lowers your blood sugar though, and what keeps your insulin levels lower. How about calcium? There's some studies that show that taking calcium pills could actually increase your risk of having a heart attack, where, but, but people need calcium as they get older. So how right. so especially we just get women, food? so especially women with our, uh, that's when I do not recommend supplementing across the board for everyone. That's when you've got to have your levels checked. You may be getting plenty in your diet. You don't need to supplement because over supplementation with calcium can lead to a multitude of problems, bone problems, uh, kidney stones. And again, there's some possible link to heart disease. So um, that's when you need to get your levels checked. You need to track ex exactly what you're eating because you may not need to, every woman may not need to supplement it. And how about collagen? Are you a fan of collagen? How, what kind okay, you take? this what is you embarrassing. Take? I'm a collagen fan for very, very vain vanity reasons only. Um, so years ago, <laughs> years ago, years <laughs> ago, I was um, trying on swimsuits, and my daughter commented about my cellulite. And so, you know, I'm looked in the mirror and was like, you know, cellulite is no prettier hanging off a bone on a thin person than it is with some muscle behind it. So uh, the scientist to me was like, what can I do about this? I mean, I eat healthy, you know, now, is there something else I can do to decrease the appearance of this? And I really got into the science of why we have cellulite and it's genetic. It's just, it's like a mattress with the buttons, you know, that you have these little fibrous bands that pull the fat tissue down. Um, so certainly if you lose fat, the fat cells become smaller, the appearance is better, but I didn't have any fat to lose. So um, there's the studies that I found from a type of collagen called Verisol, V-E-R-I-S-O-L, that they actually did biopsies and they did laser looking at depth of, of um, cellulite. And it was pretty fascinating that they saw some really great results. And these were randomized controlled studies with placebo. And I thought, you know what? It's not going to hurt me. It's worth it for me. So I Googled, where do I find this Verisol collagen? And I found a company called Sparkle. They are just a mom and pop shop. It's a lovely family who created this product from the same studies. And I've been a fan of it ever since. So really, I do it for wrinkles and cellulite. And where, does it, where do they get the collagen from? Where are they taking it from? Um, I believe it's bovine for them. It's, it's animal-based, bone marrow. Now, there are some collagen that you can find that are plant-based, but I haven't done anything with them because I'm not a vegan or a vegetarian. 
what do you think are some basic labs that females should have just to kind of know, you know, to kind of show where they are? Right. Or is that so I actually have a blog about this because I get this question so often. So at thegalvesondiet.com, if you, if you, you know, scroll through my blog, I talk about things that you can do to optimize your well woman exam or your annual wellness exam. Um, and so typically the tests that are run, you have your basic tests that most doctors will run. And then you have tests that you can probably negotiate your way into. Um, you have to know what diagnosis codes to use and what family history to gather, but you might be a candidate for kind of the extended test. So a standard test would be a CBC. Uh, you know, insurance will almost always pay for a woman to have a complete blood count and a comprehensive metabolic panel and a lipid panel. Those are kind of the basic. But if you wanna get more, um, the hemoglobin A1C is um, a, a really a stronger test, a more robust test to be able to test for your, um, then versus a single fasting blood glu glucose level. It gives you an idea of what your glucose has been running over the past six weeks. And so, you know, if you have the right family history, if you have the right symptoms, you may be able to get that test paid for. Um, most uh, women, because we have a 10% risk of hypothyroidism in women, then you probably get a TSH paid for. But if you're having symptoms, you may be able to get a full thyroid panel done, which would give you more information. You know, I think it's worth asking for the nutritional deficiencies test, at least vitamin D, zinc, and magnesium are my three favorites to look for. Um, and then um, anemia panel, you know, more than just checking a CBC, you can have iron, ferritin, folate, vitamin B12 levels checked as well. But again, usually you have to have symptoms for that. Um, and then chronic inflammation testing, not really done very often outside of like a holistic practitioner's office. But it, again, if you are having symptoms and the diagnosis code could be associated with that, that could get like a high reactive C reactive protein, a erythrocyte set. My, I'm talking too fast, uh, an ESR, a SED rate, which you know what it is, but, um, and plasma viscosity. So I have all of those linked in my blog if people want to read more about that. I also talk about what time of the day to make your appointment to go in fasting so you don't have a delay in your blood work. I want to talk about a condition which is kind of a microcosm, but an exaggeration of what happens to women, some women when they get to have, uh, when they become menopausal, which is polycystic ovary syndrome. Yeah. I feel so bad for a lot of these patients. They come into my office as, as an eye doctor, and it's easy to recognize them. Mm -hmm. And many of them have no idea that they've had it and will refer them, you know, either to an OBGYN or endocrinologist. My first question, which is the proper person to refer them to? Is an OBGYN or an endocrinologist, or it doesn't matter? And second, right. can you talk about that condition? Sure. So polycystic ovarian syndrome, I actually know quite a bit about because I have it myself. Um, well, I'm postmenopausal now, so I don't suffer the effects of the ovarian side of it, but really it's linked to insulin resistance is the pathophysiology of why a woman would develop a polycystic ovarian appearance on ultrasound, which is what the disease was named for. Um, so you know, it's kind of either or. It depends on the doctor, their level of expertise, what they're comfortable with. Certainly the OB-GYN issues should be handled by an obstetrician gynecologist. But again, they're insulin resistant and not every OB-GYN, excuse me, I'm so sorry. I thought this was off. Not every OB-GYN is going to be comfortable in helping a patient manage insulin resistance. And so um, in general, it's something that someone's born with is this predisposition to run higher insulin levels than someone who is the exact same thing at the exact same weight. You know, if you had twins, so say we had twins, one with insulin resistance and one without, um, and they're growing up the same, eating the same, the person with insulin resistance will run higher insulin levels than person B. The, there are insulin receptors everywhere and so many places in our body and lots and lots on the ovary. So there's nothing inherently wrong with our ovaries when we have polycystic ovarian syndrome. They're just doing what they're told based on the environment. So nutrition can play a huge role in the treatment and control of polycystic ovarian syndrome. My physician at the time didn't understand that and just put me right on metformin to help me get pregnant. Mine was diagnosed with, with chronic anovulation and difficulty getting pregnant when I was ready. Um, and you know, there was no talk about nutrition or diet or changes or things that we could do. They just put me right on an insulin lowering medication, um, which helped me get pregnant, which was great. But now that I look back, I'm like, gosh, I probably could have just changed my diet and done so much better and not have to go on this, you know, potentially dangerous medication. 
And as far as the diet goes, is it, is it a similar type diet? Just yes. Yeah, so of- we actually have got somehow got you know the social media thing has exploded for us, and somehow we have gotten popular with the PCOS websites, and they are constantly referring back to us. Actually, our operations manager right now is is in her thirties and trying to get pregnant. She has polycystic ovarian syndrome, and that's how she found us. Um, and has done so beautifully on the program and just kind of said, Hey, I'm looking for some work. And I was like, we're looking for people. Come on, you know, apply for this job. So, and if you could talk about some of the signs and symptoms that they have. So a person with, you know, from an OBGYN standpoint, one of the hallmarks of polycystic ovarian syndrome is irregular periods, irregular meaning skipping. So it's a, it's a woman who kind of goes through uh, adolescence normally and has regular periods. And then sometime in their te- late teenage, early 20s, they start missing periods, three, four or five at a time. And then when their cycles do come, they're extremely heavy. So that's kind of the, the you know, uh, reproductive side of it. Or they, you know, decide that they want to start a family and they can't get pregnant. Um, and they come to the doctor for evaluation. Another thing is that they start having a central weight gain. They start having that abdominal weight gain. They turn into apples instead of pears as far as their body shape. They start having hair growth suddenly at a younger age in places where they never had it before. They're noticing, you know, whiskers, mustache hair, underarm hair, extra hair growth in their abdomen or their thighs. Um, A third thing is that they can develop something called acanthosis nigricans in extreme cases, because when you run high insulin levels, you end up with these dark velvety patches. And that's how I would figure it out in the office and probably you, because you're looking in their eye, they're, you know, these dark velvety patches thick in their neck, under their arms, um, and in their, in their groin as well. Oh, and hair. Yeah. They start losing hair. Uh, because their androgen levels rise. And so they can have, start having the male, ta- male pattern type baldness issues. We talked a little bit about cortisol before. If you could talk about the different spikes in cortisol, leptin, ghrelin, yeah. talk a lot about insulin. These are things that are very important as far as your program go. Right. So we, um, I have this whole hormone intensive part of the program where I just want people to understand the basics of the science behind it. Cause I, I really believe that the, the more educated you are about the subject, the more you understand, the more likely you are to make the educated choice. That's going to be less inflammatory and lead to your health goals long-term. So cortisol and insulin are the two major hormones that control where and how we store fat. Insulin is completely linked to your fasting glucose levels and how quickly we raise our blood sugars with our nutritional choices. Um, Cortisol is our stress hormone. And so that can be raised with some nutritional choices, but mostly from our our external stimuli of going through stress. So, you know, the pandemic has done a lot. I don't wanna say the name of the virus because we'll be censored. Um, This has caused a lot of turmoil for us, you know, like in my own personal life, I've got teenagers, I've got my dad's on hospice, you know, I know my cortisol levels are running higher than I would like them to be. But the problem with these hormones, they fluctuate so much throughout the day. What I worry about is people will go to a practitioner and they'll do a one-time blood test and be like, oh, your levels are high. Certainly if you have a tumor producing cortisol, your levels will be extremely high. And that's a whole separate issue. You know, you need to see a physician for. But these baseline rates I'm talking about are hard to predict. Our cortisol levels are highest in the morning when we wake up. Um, It's meant to give us energy throughout the day to, you know, go about our daily business. Um, Leptin and ghrelin are the two major hormones that control your hunger and your satiety. And so that's, you know, what drives you to eat, the force, the emotions, the the chemicals that drive us for our next meal that make us feel hungry. And then the ones that make our brain feel full. And so a lot of people develop leptin resistance, which is your leptin levels are normal. That's the hormone that tells you you're full, stop eating, you're done, okay? Why are you so hungry an hour after you eat? Because you might have leptin resistance. Your brain never gets the signal. The the leptin can't cross the blood-brain barrier for some reason. Um, There's a lot of conditions that will make you more prone to it, but exactly why it happens, no one's really sure, but it's much higher in obesity, much higher, there's a genetic component, but you never get that signal that you're full. So you just have that continuous drive to eat, which for most of us is very hard to ignore. You think that signal changes throughout the day where people get very hungry at night, but maybe they're not hungry during the day? Possibly. I think it's very um, hard to make generalizations for a whole population with leptin and ghrelin. 
Um, I think a, there's a big genetic component and a lot of it's linked to, I know, and there's other small hormones like hormone PPY and cholecystokinin, which also feed into hunger and satiety that also, you know, and that's based on one of them is like, how much protein did you have for your last meal? That will drive your hunger for the next meal. A lot is how much fat did you have? And so one of the like quick and dirty things I tell people, you know, who can't afford the program or don't want to spend the money is, okay, every single time you eat in order to maximize these hormones working for you. Every meal, every snack should have a protein, a fat, and a carbohydrate. A healthy carb, a healthy fat, and a healthy protein. Because those three magical things will make that leptin and ghrelin work for you as efficiently as possible. You talked about cortisol. How does that, when it's abnormal, how, why does it work, wake people up at night and affect their sleep? Um, there's a, a big variation in how cortisol runs on day to day. Like when we would test cortisol levels in clinic, we would have people do it first thing in the morning or at 10 AM was like a good time to test cortisol for people who had, you know, a regular sleeping pattern. Certainly if you're in shift work, it's never going to work for you. But, um, and so, because we're trying to get um, cortisol checked at the highest level it's expected and the lowest level to see how far outside of the ranges it is. And when we're doing things that make our cortisol levels fluctuate, cortisol, you know, determines so much of our metabolism. Um, it absolutely can be affected by sleep. Um, lack of sleep can affect cortisol. Cortisol can affect sleep. It's you get in this negative feedback cycle there as well. When I talk to my sleep medicine specialist friends, um, a lot of that stuff is driven and a lot of that stuff can be, that's why a sleep medicine specialist will talk about things to do for sleep hygiene in the bedroom. And a lot of it's stress relief. You don't want to be looking at your phone. It stresses you out right before you go to bed. You want to put that phone down for at least an hour before you lay down to sleep. You know, all of that feeds into each other. What are some healthy foods that help balance cortisol? I know I've heard you talk about dark yeah. chocolate. It's one ounce of dark uh -huh. chocolate a day. Uh, I was happy to hear that. Yeah, dark chocolate. Um, it's got to be at least 70% dark, you know, cacao and um, as little added sugar as possible to it. Um, so you don't undo the, the good benefits of the um, antioxidants that are naturally in chocolate. Um, leafy green vegetables do go a very long route. Um, fiber, anything we can do to decrease our insulin levels and bring those blood sugar down, fiber, the soluble fiber does a lot for that. Um, so, so, lit, um, legumes, so that's going to be your beans, your okra, um, your whole grains, your um, seeds, nuts, all of that goes a long way. And how pro, pro and prebiotics? So, okay, um, probiotics, there's some awesome studies. You know, I, I love everything that has a randomized control study that look at, there was one actually done on women who were obese and menopausal looking at probiotic supplementation versus placebo. And the women who took probiotics consistently for 12 weeks had decreased uh, visceral fat, decrease abdominal circumference. Um, so it's important with a probiotic that you can get it from food. When I took my daughter on a high school field trip to um, pre-COVID to um, Japan, they have fermented foods, which are pro naturally probiotic rich with every single meal. They don't have a meal where there's not a fermented vegetable, breakfast even. So they're eating it all day. We're not doing that in the US. So we might eat yogurt from time to time. That's a great source of a probiotic. Some of the more exotic things, kombucha, sauerkraut, you know, some of the Chinese pickles are fermented. Um, but people in general don't eat that every day. So that's why for most people, some supplementation with a probiotic could be important. You want at least a billion. You want as many genre as possible. So there's genus and species for the different probiotics. You need to have them live or they're dead and they don't work. So those are all, you know, I, I, on one of my videos, I took people probiotic shopping and showed them how overwhelming and how many options there were and showed them the ones that I picked, you know, for women's health that I felt like might be a good option for people. A prebiotic is simply soluble fiber. Okay, so some people will package the probiotic with a prebiotic, you can get that through food. You don't need to spend extra money on that. That's an easy thing to get in your diet. And the postbiotic, which is a new thing in the literature, is basically, I talked about a little bit before, the, the butyrates that are produced by the fermentation. You don't need to supplement that if you're eating enough soluble fiber, if you have enough probiotics in your diet, your body will make those postbiotics. You don't need to add them. Kombucha, you know, this is a big fad now in Whole Foods, mm -hmm. you can buy kombucha mm -hmm. in the health food places, but they have a lot of sugar in it, you know, maybe 10 grams of uh -huh. sugar. Is that too many? 
Well, you know, you have a budget, you have 25 grams per day. So if you choose to do half of them in your kombucha drink, then go for it. So let's talk about the gut microbiome. Why is that so important for women's health? Oh gosh, it's important for everyone's health. Um, but the studies I look at tend to be what it does for women because that's my area of expertise and my area of clinical interest. Um, so we know that when your gut microbiota is unhappy and unhealthy, it's going to let you know. Everything's going to be inflamed. You're going to have much higher blood sugars. You're going to have um, lower insulin levels. Everything in your in your body is not going to be as efficient. And um, and at, at, a, at a cellular level, when the gut microbiome is pro-inflammatory, so you've got a bad, an unhealthy mix of bacteria, they're not functioning properly, they're not being fed the right things, the, the colon cells, um, the columnar cells of the colon, the mucosal cells, will not function properly. And so you're going to start pulling in, this is the leaky gut, you know, and this is a little controversial, but, but the experts who research this feel like you're starting to pull in things that would have been left behind into the gut. So you're really pro-inflammatory things rather than being passed through the colon or being absorbed and you're decreasing the absorption of some of the healthier things. And now what are some of the things that really hurt the, uh, the, the, the gut? The um, definitely too many um, added sugars. So added sugars in the form of, you know, added sugars, Added, you know, the sucrose added to our high fructose corn syrup um, and, and processed wheat products. So when you strip away the grain and the bran and all the good things about wheat, and you're just left with the endosperm, which is basically sugar, you're doing a ton of damage. Other things are artificial colors, artificial flavors, things just really not found in nature. We really shouldn't put in our bodies because it wreaks havoc. Um, and nitrites are huge. And what helps it? What helps it? So Things rich in fiber are really the best thing that you can do. Feed, you're just feeding, you know, the garden uh, with the things that it needs. Um, so avoiding the bad things and making sure you're getting enough soluble fiber in your diet um, are really the two best things that you can do. And, and um, restocking the supply with probiotics from time to time. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner, not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.